Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm James Kenley, the Executive Director of the Vail Symposium. And on behalf of our Board of Directors, our small but mighty staff, and our team of volunteers, thank you for being with us and welcome to a sold out evening with Bill Browder. For those of you who don't know us, the Vail Symposium is a nonprofit organization. We've been bringing thought-provoking, diverse, and affordable programming to the Vail community since 1971. Ticket sales account for about 10% of our operating budget. And so the other 90% are sponsors at every level from community members just like you. I'd like to thank a few of them uh, for making tonight's program possible. Our presenting sponsors are the Town of Vail and the Frechette Family Foundation. Our event sponsors are Vail Resort's Epic Promise, the Vail Daily, the Antlers at Vail. Our summer season is underwritten by Cindy Engels, and the Hot Topics series is underwritten by Kathy and Neil Kimmel. Tonight's program is underwritten by Sue and Mike Rushmore, it is presented in partnership with B'nai Vale, and it was developed in partnership with Rebecca Zweig of Business Smart Solutions. We have special thanks to give to Johannes and his team at the San Elb Hotel, as well as Dr. David Cohen and our venue this evening, Homestake Peak School. Would you please give them all a round of applause and provide a breeze for your neighbors? <clears throat> Our presenter this evening may not need an introduction, nor does the subject matter, given how many of you have read Red Notice and Freezing Order. <laughs> uh, and I know that none of us up here live under a rock. Uh, to frame this, the discussion this evening and to bring out Mr. Browder is a good friend of the Vail Symposium, Mr. Greg Dobbs. In addition to his esteemed post on our programming committee, Greg is a three-time Emmy award-winning journalist for over 50 years, 25 of which were spent at ABC News, reporting from all around the globe, including Russia. Greg will join Bill in conversation later in the program, and he'll get us started now. Please welcome Greg Dobbs. Thank you, James. Good uh, afternoon, and James, thank you. Uh, many of you probably came, most of you probably came to see and hear Bill Browder because you've read his first best-selling book, Red Notice, the full title of which is Red Notice, A True Story of High Finance, Murder, and One Man's Fight for Justice. Or you've read the second bestseller as well, Freezing Order, A True Story of Money Laundering, Murder, and surviving Vladimir Putin's wrath. Think about that, Vladimir Putin's wrath. You saw security when you came into the auditorium. There is security here until this program has concluded. For Bill Browder, that's how he has to deal with and survive Vladimir Putin's wrath. If you've read Bill's books, you know that he did business in Russia. And he learned things about the nation and its people that most who go there, even other business people, diplomats, certainly tourists, uh, never get to learn, maybe more pointedly, never, never have to learn. Uh, as a journalist, occasionally I covered Russia, and before that, the Soviet Union. And what I learned, uh, I would put it this way, people outside the United States look at us, they can pretty much read us like a book. But what I learned about Russia and the Soviet Union before that was that there are more mysteries about the nation and its people than there are certainties. Uh, Winston Churchill described Russia almost 85 years ago this way. He said, Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And the thing is, in 85 years, it hasn't much changed. Bill dives into the enigma. He dives into the enigma. His take on Putin and Russia would be invaluable at any point, but now, 
We are just a couple of days short of 17 months after Putin's merciless march into Ukraine. It's more valuable than ever. As James said, after Bill talks, I'm going to step in and ask some questions, and then there'll be time for some of you to do the same. And that leaves me nothing else to say, but ladies and gentlemen, Bill Browder. Thanks. Well, great to be here um, in Vail um, with such a big audience and such a warm welcome. Um, uh, so I, I, um, I've written two books, as you've heard. My first book, uh, Red Notice, was an unlikely success. It's, it's very rare for a person from the world of finance to be able to write a book. <clears throat> It's even rarer um, for a person in finance to write a book that other people want to read. And um, in my first book, uh, for those of you who have read it, is all about my journey from being a hedge fund manager to being a human rights activist. And, um, and I guess the reason why it was successful is that it's, it's a rare story because you don't have many people from Wall Street going to do humanitarian work. Um, it has a a, a perfect narrative arc, uh, and it really was like lightning striking <clears throat> in the sense that it was successful. The, the chances of that happening were extremely, extremely low. And, and I wrote it with the intention of never writing another book again. And the story ends pretty much with the passage of the Magnitsky Act in 2012. The Magnitsky Act was a piece of legislation named after my a murdered Russian lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, which freezes the assets and bans the visas of people who killed him and other crooks in Russia and around the world. And um, after the Magnitsky Act was passed, Putin got really, really mad at me. Uh, he, he got mad at me because he's a guy who um, kills for money, has accumulated a lot of money, and I put his money at risk. And so after the Magnitsky Act was passed, um, he went on a mission to try to have me killed, have me kidnapped, um, have me arrested. I was on the Interpol list eight times from Russia, extradited. They tried to have me extradited from London, various other types of things. And the stories that accumulated after the book was finished were so crazy and so extreme and so actually important to tell that is in spite of the fact that it was so unlikely that I wrote a, a good book the first time, I decided I was going to write a second book. And um, I procrastinated for a while, and, um, and then I began the process of writing in, the, in July of 2018. I normally live in London, um, but I have a house in Aspen, and um, we were in Aspen when I was starting to write this second book. And there's nothing worse than when you're an author and you um, have a empty page and you're trying to start a book. It's the worst part of the whole book writing process. So I, I set up in Aspen and I tell my children to not come anywhere near the dining room for five hours from the morning until lunchtime. Uh, I set up my computer, but I turn off the Wi-Fi so I don't have any messages coming in. Um, I put my uh, phone face down and on silent and I started staring at this empty screen. And um, I, it wasn't coming out. There was, I, I couldn't come up with any good ideas on how to start this book. And I typed a paragraph and read it and erased it and stared at the screen for a while, stared out the window, typed another paragraph, same thing. And finally, after about an hour and 20 minutes of like nothing on the page, I, I can't take it any longer. I turn over my phone. And there's 173 new messages on my phone in that last hour and 20 minutes. The first one read, Bill, are you watching Helsinki? Uh, the next one read, if you need a place to hide out, you can use my cabin in the mountains. And what they were all, all these messages were referring to was that um, that was the day, that, that I, the day I started my book was a day that the Helsinki summit was taking place between Trump and Putin. And this was taking place on a Monday, on the previous Friday, Robert Mueller, the special counsel investigating 
uh, Russian interference in the U.S. political process, had indicted 12 Russian military intelligence officers uh, for their role in election interference. So that, was, that happened on Friday. The summit was taking place on the Monday. Um, Trump and Putin had a meeting, about a four and a half hour meeting. No other people were present at this meeting. There was no entourage, no national security advisor, no secretary of state, just Trump and Putin and one of Putin's aides. So they have this meeting, which I would describe as a secret meeting because there was no notes that ever emerged from that meeting. And then at the end of the meeting, both of these heads of state come out into a room with a, two lecterns and the world's media sitting there ready, waiting, to answer, or waiting to ask questions. So Putin walks out, he struts out like he owns the place, looking very self-confident. Trump a little bit less so, he's kind of hunched over. They go to the respective lecterns and the questions start. And about three questions in, a Reuters correspondent asks the obvious question that everyone was waiting for, which is to Putin, um, Mr. President, um, are you planning on handing over the 12 Russian military intelligence officers who were indicted by special counsel Robert Mueller? Putin was not at all surprised by this question. It was sort of obvious that this was going to come. He had been preparing for it all weekend. He smiled and he said, yes, entirely possible that we'd hand over these in individuals. But if we did so, we would expect some reciprocity from our American friends. And specifically, we would expect our American friends to hand over Bill Browder, me. <laughs> so of the seven some odd billion people that exist on the planet, <clears throat> I am the one guy who's called out in this um, press conference, which was obviously very unpleasant, as you can imagine. Um, but it wasn't at all surprising. As I mentioned, Putin has been um, coming after me for years and regularly mentioning me in press conferences and other things. And so it wasn't a surprise. But what was a surprise was what happened next. A couple questions later, a, a different journalist asked President Trump, what do you think of Putin's offer? And Trump, without skipping a beat, said, I think it's an incredible offer. <laughs> now that did surprise me. <laughs> to have the most powerful man in the free world offering to hand me over um, to a brutal dictator who wants to kill me was very unpleasant. And at the time I was sitting in Aspen and I wasn't in London, where, which is my normal home. I was in Aspen where he could easily have sent out a bunch of SUVs blacked out from the Department of Homeland Security or the Secret Service, put a bag over my head, put me in a plane and deliver me to Putin. Um, so it was pretty awful. In, in any event, the two presidents left and I was expecting after they left that um, as, as Trump boarded Air Force One with the Washington press corps, that one of his aides would have um, gathered the press corps and said, I just want to clarify something from the press conference. Um, what the president meant to say was that it was an incredibly bad offer. <laughs> but total silence. So Trump goes back to Washington, Putin goes to Moscow, and overnight Putin wakes up and he realizes that he's made a terrible, terrible mistake. Putin sees himself as the master negotiator, the toughest guy out there. And here we had this situation where the Americans had asked for 12 and he only asked for one. And so he decided to add 11 other people to his list of people to be handed over. He wanted Mike McFall, the former US ambassador to Russia, who was a friend of mine and someone who had helped me with the Magnitsky Act. He asked for Kyle Parker, who was the chief of staff of the US Helsinki Commission, which is a congressional commission um, that in he, this individual wrote the Magnitsky Act. He asked for three agents from the Department of, Department of Homeland Security um, who were investigating money laundering connected to the Magnitsky case. Basically, everybody um, on Putin's list was a friend of mine who had helped with the Magnitsky Act, who was either a current or former US government official. Now, 
This is the moment that the U.S. government, the Trump administration, should have pushed back hard. Who would ever join the U.S. government if you could make, work on some policy goal in one administration and then have a subsequent administration hand you over to a hostile foreign power? Nobody. And so it, it would kind of ruin the employment prospects for employing anyone in the U.S. government if they did this. And so you would have expected that, that within moments of this suggestion that the Trump administration would have pushed back. But there was no pushback. One day goes by, nothing, two days, three days, four days. On the fourth day, I'm giving an interview to Fox News. And I should point out that there's absolutely no difference in opinion from the far left to the far right on the media, in, in Congress, anywhere on this issue. Everybody thought it was outrageous. So Fox was interviewing me, and um, we're in the middle of the interview, and about halfway through, they say, um, we have to take a break here, Mr. Browder. There's a press conference at the right White House. We're going straight to the press conference. So I'm sitting there with my earpiece in, listening to the press conference of the White House. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the president's spokesperson, is running the press conference. Three questions in. Maggie Haberman from the New York Times raises her hand, and she says, is the president planning on handing over Bill Browder, Ambassador McFall, and the 10 others? And this was the moment we were expecting that she would say, of course not, that would never happen. But she didn't say that. She said, the president is considering his options. He's, con he's consulting his advisors. We will let you know. At this point, all hell broke in, in, uh, in Washington. And, and the next day, the Senate was going to have a vote on whether to hand us over or not. And as the vote, the vote was going to take place at 4 p.m., and, and during the morning, various uh, senators and members of the House of Representatives all started issuing tweets and, and press statements and press releases talking about how outrageous it was. And again, the absolutely, totally bipartisan. Nobody wanted to hand us over. Um, the Trump uh, people started to see that this, was, this vote could have gone disastrously against them. And so at 3.30, half an hour before the vote was going to take place, um, the White House issued a very terse, short, and meek statement saying, well, we understand that Putin's request was sincere. Um, we're going to be unable to honor it at this time. <laughs> a half an hour later, the Senate voted 98 to 0 not to hand us over. And so when I say that I'm happy to be here today, I really am very happy to be here. <laughs> so um, I'm going to spend the next half hour or so explaining how I got into this mess. And then in the Q&A, um, we can talk about where we're going with this whole horrific war that Putin has started. So my story is a very unusual story. Um, I, I was um, uh, born in, in Princeton, New Jersey. I was brought up in Chicago, but I come from a very unusual American family. Uh, my grandfather, Earl Browder, who was a labor union organizer in Wichita, Kansas in the 1920s, was so good at organizing the unions that he was invited to Moscow in 1927. They said, it was the international wing of the Communist Party. They said, if you like labor unionism, you're going to love communism. Why don't you come and check it out? So my grandfather goes to Moscow in 1927. He immediately meets a Russian girl who becomes my grandmother. My father is born in Moscow. And then five years later, they return to America, and my grandfather becomes the general secretary of the American Communist Party. 1932. He runs for president in 1936 and 1940 against Roosevelt on the communist ticket. He's imprisoned by Roosevelt in 1941, pardoned in 42. He's expelled from the Communist Party in 1945 for being too much of a capitalist. And then he's viciously persecuted during the McCarthy era in the 1950s because he was a communist. So this is my family legacy. I was born in, in 1964, I'm 59 years old. And when I was going through my teenage rebellion in the 1970s, <clears throat> I was trying to figure out a good way to rebel from this family of communists. <clears throat> I grew my hair long, you can't tell now, but it grew into an afro, and that didn't upset my family. 
I followed the Grateful Dead around the country for several months. That also didn't upset my family. But then I came up with the perfect way of upsetting my family, which was to put on a suit and tie and become a capitalist. <laughs> and that really pissed them off. So I become a capitalist, and I end up going to Stanford Business School. And I graduate business school in 1989, which was a very auspicious year, because that was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And as I was trying to figure out what to do with my career after business school, I had an epiphany one day, which is that if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America, and the Berlin Wall has just come down, I'm going to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And so that's what I set out to do. So I originally moved to London, and I get a job at Solomon Brothers. Um, I had several jobs, but I ended up with Solomon Brothers. The, um, it doesn't exist anymore, but the big American investment bank um, made famous by Michael Lewis's book, Liar's Poker. And if you like my books, you'll like his book if you haven't read it. And um, I get a job in Solomon Brothers on the Russian investment banking team. And uh, my very first assignment at Solomon Brothers um, was to advise a fishing fleet located in Murmansk, which is a couple hundred miles north of the Arctic Circle, on their privatization. So I, I get on a plane to Murmansk, the head of the fishing fleet meets me at the airport. He says, before we go in and um, talk business, I want you to see one of our ships. And so we drive down to the docks, we get out of his car, and before me is this enormous vessel. It's about 400 feet long. It's on five different stories. On the top, they have the fishing nets. The next level, they do the separation of the fish. They then treat the fish, and all the way down to the basement of the um, ship where they have canning machines, and they can the fish. And so it wasn't just a fishing boat, it was an ocean-going factory. And um, I said, and it was very impressive, I said, how much does one of these things cost? He said, $20 million new. How many do you have in your fleet? A hundred. So I did the math, 100 times 20 million gets you to $2 billion worth of ships. How, uh, what's the age of your fleet? He said, about seven years. I don't know anything about, didn't know anything about shipping then, and, Still don't, but I figured that that makes it about half depreciated. So a billion dollars worth of ships. And I'd been hired by this um, uh, fishing fleet company, by the management, to advise them on whether or not to exercise their legitimate right under the privatization program of Russia to buy 51% of the fleet. It's being sold to the management, 51% of the fleet. And I said, at what price is the government selling you 51%? And he said, two and a half million dollars. <laughs> Let me just repeat the math. There's a, there's a billion dollars of the ships, you can buy 51% for two and a half million dollars. You don't need a Stanford MBA or you don't need to be a Solomon Brothers investment banker to know that that's a good deal. And so I advised him, yes, of course you should. But I was really dissatisfied because I didn't want to be getting paid some measly advisory fee. I wanted to be investing in this, this stuff. And I was trying to figure out whether this was just a, uh, an anomaly in the fishing business or it was something more widespread. And so I went to Moscow to do some more meetings, and I discovered that the entire country was being sold off at these ridiculous low valuations. The market capitalization of Russia at the time of, the, of, the, of this privatization, 1992, was $10 billion. This is the whole country. This is a country with 35% of the world's natural gas, 10% of the world's oil, 10% of the world's aluminum. There's fertilizer and timber and electricity and telephone companies and car companies. The whole country, $10 billion. You couldn't buy a mid-sized oil company in Oklahoma for $10 billion. You could buy the whole country of Russia. And so on the back of that, um, I went back to Solomon and I told them we have to be investing in this stuff, not advising on this stuff. It took a while, but we eventually um, got some money to invest. I had $25 million to invest. Um, I put it into, the, uh, into these privatizations. In one year, my $25 million turned into $125 million. Um, and I became a hero on the trading floor of Solomon Brothers. I decided to quit, to set up my own investment fund. I moved to Moscow in 1996. I set up a fund called the Hermitage Fund uh, to invest in, in the Russian stock market. I raised $25 million from one of, one of my clients, and I was off to the races. 
And my fund um, was an unbelievable success. We started with $25 million, and by the end of the first year, um, we were managing <clears throat> more than a billion dollars. I was up 780%. I was the best performing fund manager in the world. Um, everything was just looking un unbelievably well. I was being featured in the business pages of the New York Times and the Financial Times and all sorts of other great stuff. I thought it was all going to go to the sky. And then in 1998, Russia uh, defaulted on their bonds. They devalued their currency by 75%. And I lost $900 million, 90% of my clients' money. It was hugely unprofitable, humiliating. Um, and I made this vow that I was going to get, that, get my clients' money back. And, um, and in theory, it shouldn't have been that hard because when a country goes through a big devaluation, um, and particularly a country that sells export things like oil or gas or whatever, their export prices stay in dollars, but their input prices, the um, price of labor and other things, are in their local currency, in rubles. And the ruble is devalued by 75%. So their costs should go down. The revenues stay the same. The difference between costs and revenues is profits. That should explode, and we should have recovered. The problem was that these companies were all majority owned by these people known as the Russian oligarchs. And the Russian oligarchs owned between 51 and 95% of these companies. And they never really thought of these companies as being companies for shareholders. They just thought these were companies for themselves. And, um, and so after the devaluation and default, um, these oligarchs said, well, why don't we just take 100% of everything that's coming into these companies for ourselves? Let's just steal everything. And so the oligarchs embarked on an orgy of stealing which has been unprecedented in the history of business. They were doing asset stripping, transfer pricing, embezzlement, dilution. And effectively, they were going to steal the last 10 cents on the dollar that I had left after I had made this big decision. I was going to try to get all the, my clients' money back. And so I started to um, look for ways in which I could try to stop them. And you couldn't stop these people from stealing by going to the government because there's nobody regulating in the government. The police aren't policing. Everybody's on the payroll. There was, there was no point. But I came up with this idea, which is that the one thing the oligarchs seemed to care about a little bit was their reputation in the West. They were all you know, going to the south of France. They were trying to, trying to engage with Wall Street. They were trying to do all sorts of things in the West. And so what I decided to do was to research how they went about doing the stealing, and then share that research with the international media, to naming and shaming campaigns. Now you may say, how is it possible to research how they do stealing in Russia? Um, you'd think of Russia as being a very untransparent place. But in fact, it's, it's a very transparent place for a very strange reason. Russia is the most bureaucratic country in the world. Everything you do in Russia gets tracked by some government bureaucrat. You go to the bathroom, you've got to write your name on the bathroom machine. At the end of the day, it gets entered into three different databases. Everything in Russia is like that. And the people in these bureaucracies that, that collect all this information don't get paid a living wage, and so what do they do? They put it up for sale. You can basically buy any information about anybody in Russia. And so if, um, if I was meeting any of you in Russia and I wanted to do a little due diligence before our meeting, I could buy a database and find out what your bank balance is. I could figure out where you've traveled for the last 10 years. I could see who you've called. I could even look at your medical records. All this stuff is for sale for like a very small amount of money. And so what we would do is we would buy these databases about these companies, and then we would be able to figure out exactly who was stealing what, how they were stealing, where it was going, et cetera, everything. And so we would take this information, put it into nice, neatly um, uh, formatted PowerPoint presentations, and then I would share it with the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times uh, and the New York Times. And the journalists loved me because I was saving them three months' worth of work. And so I would give them to these journalists. They would publish these stories. And then the most un unbelievable thing happened. This new guy who had just become president of Russia this little, little man, Vladimir Putin, um, it turned out that he had the same problem I had. The oligarchs were stealing money from me, 
and he had just become president and they were stealing power from him. And I've never met Vladimir Putin then, I haven't met him since then and I, and I haven't uh, uh, now, um, but there's this expression that your enemy's enemy is your friend. And so every time I would put one of these exposés out there, <clears throat> Vladimir Putin would step in to go after these oligarchs. And he would use whatever power he had to um, crush the oligarchs based on my exposés. And it was highly profitable. And so, you remember, I went from a 25 million to a billion, down to 100 million. After we started doing these exposés, and, and Putin was stepping in, we went from 100 million to four and a half billion. It went up 45 times. And so I thought this was pretty great. Um, you know, I, I could make money um, and go, the, go after the bad guys and do some good at the same time. And, I thought, and, and Putin, what a great guy he is. He's stepping in to help me out. I was really a big fan. And I, I, went, I had the best life in the world. I was making all this money for my clients, for myself. I was doing good. You know, Putin was a good guy. What could be better? And, um, and this went on for about three and a half years, and I, I was just sitting on top of the world. And then one day, at the end of 2003, Putin decides that he's going to win his war with the oligarchs. He arrests the richest oligarch in Russia, a man named Mikhail Hordakovsky, who was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. He arrests him, he <clears throat> puts him on trial, and then he allows the television cameras to come into the courtroom and film the richest man in Russia on trial, sitting in a cage. When you go on trial, you sit in a cage. So imagine you're the 17th richest oligarch in Russia, and you see a guy far richer, far smarter, and far more powerful than you, sitting in a cage. What's your natural reaction? You don't want to sit in that cage yourself. And so one by one by one, after Hordakovsky was sentenced to 10 years in prison, the oligarchs went to Putin. He said, Vladimir, okay, what do we have to do so we don't sit in the cage? Putin said, real simple, 50%. Not 50% for the Russian government, not 50% for the presidential administration of Russia, 50% for Vladimir Putin. And that was the moment that Putin became the richest man in the world. And that was the moment that all of my naming and shaming campaigns no longer um, suits, suited his interests. I was now naming and shaming his 50% economic interest. And it didn't take them that long to figure out what to do. I was flying back to Russia in November of 2005 from a trip to London. I'd been living in Russia for 10 years. I was now their largest foreign investor. And I'm going through the VIP lounge at, Sh at Shermetyevo Airport. This is a a much uh, expedited way to get through the airport when you arrive. I've been, I've been through this VIP lounge like 250 times before. Usually it takes between 30 seconds and two minutes. I'm sitting there for an hour. They still haven't processed my passport. I'm getting annoyed. I got my driver to like go up to the, uh, to the guy who does the passports, try to figure out what's going on. And just as he goes up to them, four heavily armed guards, border guards, burst into the VIP lounge. They grab me, they frog march me down to the detention center of the airport, and they lock me up. They lock me up overnight, and I don't know whether I'm being arrested or deported. I'm sitting there overnight, can't sleep a wink, terrified that I might be sent to Siberia like Hordakovsky. The next morning, I'm waiting for them to tell me what's going to happen. The, the flight back to London is at 11 o'clock. It's 9.30. I'm waiting for them to come and take me away for the flight. They don't, they're not coming, I'm banging on the bars, I'm making a fuss, nobody's coming. 10 o'clock, still nothing, I'm starting to get more and more worried. 10.30, I'm in an absolute state of panic. And at like 10.42, they come to me, frog march me back to the airplane, throw me on an Aeroflot flight, middle seat, and send me back to London, deport me. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Argo. Um, as that plane took off, I, was, it was, I had the best feeling in the world that I wasn't going to be sent to Siberia. When I get to London, I find out that I've been declared a threat to national security of Russia. Um, at this point, I'm terrified, not for myself anymore, um, but we have a bunch of money in Russia and we have a bunch of people in Russia. And so I evacuate my staff. 
and we sell every last security we hold in Russia. Get our people out, get our money out. And I think that's the end of my story. It's not the end of the story at all. It's the beginning of the worst nightmare you could ever imagine. 18 months after I was expelled, the one person I had left in Russia was a secretary who sat in my empty office. She calls me up in hysterics. She said, there's 25 police officers here raiding the office. What should I do? I call up my lawyer, an American lawyer in Moscow, and tell him what's going on. He said, there's 25 more officers here right now raiding our office looking for your documents. In total, there are 50 police officers raiding both of our offices looking for the stamp seals and certificates for our investment holding companies, the companies through which we had invested all this money in Russia, which were empty at this point, but they didn't know that. They're empty because we sold everything. They find the documents at the law firm, they take the documents away, and the next thing we know, we no longer own these investment holding companies. They have been fraudulently re-registered using the documents seized by the police, fraudulently re-registered out of our name into the name of somebody who had been convicted of manslaughter and let out of jail early by the police. Now, I'm terrified, not for any economic reasons, our money is completely safe, but if the police are working with killers to steal our companies, I'm going to be walking through Frankfurt Airport someday, a couple of years from then, and I'll be arrested on a Russian warrant for sure. And so I needed to stop this, whatever it was that was going on. And so I go out to try to find the smartest lawyer I can find in Russia. And I hire a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. At the time, Sergei was 35 years old. He was one of these people that could do 10 things in the time it takes another lawyer to do one. True genius. And I say to Sergei, I need you to figure out what's going on, investigate it, figure it out, and stop it. So he goes out and investigates. And he comes back after a big investigation and says, I figured out what's going on. There were two parts of the scam. The first was they wanted to steal all of your money. But when they got to the banks and the custodians to get your money, and the money was long gone because you got it out of there. He said, good for you. He said, however, the second part worked. And what he described was when we had sold everything in the previous year, we had a huge profit. We had a billion dollars of profit. And on that billion dollars of profit, we paid $230 million of capital gains tax to the Russian government. And what Sergei had figured out was that these corrupt people who, who seized our companies, the police, they worked together um, with people from the tax authorities and with organized criminals. And they went and applied, and they went to the um, tax authorities and they said there was a mistake made in the previous year's tax filings. These companies didn't earn a billion dollars they earned zero. Therefore, <clears throat> the $230 million of taxes was paid in error, and they asked for it back. They applied for a $230 million tax refund um, on the 23rd of December, two days before Christmas. It was paid back the next day. The largest tax refund in the history of Russia on a fraud paid back in one day on Christmas Eve. Sergei and I were convinced this must be a rogue operation because Putin, he may not be a nice guy, but he's a, he's a patriot and a nationalist. And so we figured if we just wrote uh, criminal complaints to the highest level of Russian law enforcement, and if we um, uh, went to the media and publicized the whole thing, then everything would be fine. So uh, we wrote criminal complaints to every different law enforcement agency in Russia. I went to the TV, radio, newspapers. Sergei went to the Russian State Investigative Committee, which is their version of the FBI, and gave sworn testimony against the corrupt officials involved. And we sat back and waited for the good guys to get the bad guys. Well, it turns out there are no good guys. Five weeks after Sergei testified against these corrupt officials, the same officials he testified against arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then began to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds, left lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat, no window panes, in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They'd move him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of all this was to get him to withdraw his testimony 
against the corrupt police officers. And they wanted to get him to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million. And he did so on my instruction. And Sergei was a man of incredible integrity. And for him, the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was more awful than the physical pain he was uh, being subjected to. And he refused. And as a result, the torture got worse and worse and worse. After six months, um, <clears throat> he ended up losing about 40 pounds. Um, he was diagnosed um, with uh, pancreatitis and gallstones. He, he was prescribed an operation for his uh, physical ailments on the 1st of August, 2009. And about a week before the operation, they came to him again and asked him again to sign a false confession. Again, he refused. And in retaliation, they moved him from a prison that had a medical wing to a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which is considered to be one of the worst in Russia, and there they had no medical wing. At Butyrka, his health went into a terrible downward spiral. He was in constant, agonizing pain, and they refused him all medical treatment. He and his lawyers wrote 20 different desperate requests for medical attention to every different branch of the criminal justice system. Every one of those requests was either ignored or denied in writing. Things got worse and worse and worse, and on the night of November 16th, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. On that night, the Butyrka authorities didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore. And they put him in an ambulance and sent him to a different prison across town that did have a medical wing. But when he got there, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell. They chained him to a bed. And eight riot guards came into that cell and beat Sergei Magnitsky until he died. He was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children, November 16, 2009. I got the news the next day, and it was the most horrifying, heartbreaking, life-changing news I could have ever gotten. He was effectively killed as my proxy. They killed him because they couldn't kill me. And when I was finally able to get through the, um, the heartbreak of, of and hysteria and foggy thinking to think clearly, I made a vow to his memory uh, to his family and to myself, that I was gonna put aside everything else I was go doing and I was going to devote all of my time, energy and resources going after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. And that's what I've been doing for the last 13 and a half years. And at first I thought we'd try to get justice in Russia. Sergei did something very unusual, he wrote it all down. In his 358 days in detention, he wrote 450 complaints documenting everything that happened to him. He'd hand them to his lawyer once a month. His lawyer would file them. They would be ignored or denied, but we got copies. <clears throat> we had the most well-documented case of human rights abuse that's ever come out of Russia. And we thought that that would at least force some people to be prosecuted, but nobody was prosecuted. Putin got involved personally. They circled the wagons. Putin exonerated every, every single person involved. Um, they even put Sergei Magnitsky on trial three years after they killed him in the first trial against a dead man in the history of Russia. They found me guilty along with him in absentia. It became obvious that there was no chance of getting justice in Russia. So I said, how do we get justice outside of Russia? And that's when I came up with this idea, which is that they killed him for money and they keep that money in the West. And so I went to Washington and I told the same story I've just shared with you with two senators, a Democratic senator from Maryland, um, Senator Cardin, a uh, Republican senator from Arizona, John McCain. And I said, can we freeze their assets and ban their visas? And these two senators said yes. And that became known as the Magnitsky Act. And at the time, there was no pro-Russian torture and murder lobby in Washington. And, and when it went for a vote, it passed 92 to 4. It passed the House of Representatives with 89% and it became a federal law on December 14th, 2012. Vladimir Putin went out of his mind when the Magnitsky Act was passed. For him, this was the most existential threat there ever was because he steals money in Russia and keeps it in the West. He values Russia, uh, money <clears throat> more than human life. He banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families as a retaliation. He made repealing the Magnitsky Act his single 
and most important foreign policy priority, and they started coming after me. Now, thankfully, he hasn't gotten me. I'm here today. And most importantly, um, the Magnitsky Act has never been repealed. In fact, it was expanded in 2016, not just to go after Russian human rights violators, but to go after human rights violators everywhere in the world. In Canada, they passed in 2017 a Canadian Magnitsky Act. In the UK, a UK Magnitsky Act in 2018. In the EU, in 2020. In Australia, in 2021. Um, we have Iceland, Norway, Kosovo, Montenegro. There are now 35 countries in the world that have a Magnitsky Act. Sergei Magnitsky... You know, for me, Sergei Magnitsky's death will hang over my shoulders forever. I'm never going to be able to recover from it. But I have done something, which is I've made sure that his death wasn't a meaningless death, that his death will help save lives, hopefully across the world. The Magnitsky Act is something that every dictator and despot fears. They absolutely are terrified of having their money in the West frozen. And so my hope is that we can't bring Sergei back, but I can leave him with an indelible memory, which is a legacy, which is that his death will save, hopefully, millions of lives. Thank you very much. Bill, you told us the tragedy of Sergei could have been the tragedy of Bill Browder as well. We do know that Vladimir Putin, we've seen it firsthand, he can reach outside Russia. He can even reach London, and he has. How have you and how have your family coped with that? Well, um, the first thing I would say is that he's definitely, for a long, so I, I used to be, the title of my, or the subtitle of my first book in Europe, not, not here, but in Europe is, um, it's called Red Notice is the main title, and the subtitle is How I Became Putin's Number One Enemy. And for, for a long time, I genuinely was his number one enemy, until now. Um, Zelensky is definitely his number one enemy. Um, uh, Navalny, uh, high there, high up there. Prigozhin now. And so I'm probably off the first page if on, the, on his Google search of enemies. But when I was his, his number one enemy, um, one of the things that everybody said to me, all my wise friends and lawyers and specialists on security is, Bill, go to ground, you know, disappear, um, you know, stop all this stuff. And I did just the opposite. Um, if you go to ground, if, if nobody knows who you are, um, uh, they kill you and they get away with it. Um, and so I did just the opposite. I went completely in their face. Every day, all the time, every news channel, books, TV, everything. Um, and it became a very troublesome thing for them. Um, and they've tried to have me arrested in different places. And when I get arrested, I've been arrested in Madrid and Geneva. When I get arrested, all of a sudden it comes really back hard on the country that, that cooperated with them and, and they let me go. And, and it seems like the counterintuitive strategy of being public is... is so far, and I'll knock on wood, and hope you all will, on my behalf, um, save me so far. That said, do you ever reach into your gut? Are you always at least a little bit tense, a little bit nervous, a little bit aware? No, um, I'm not. Uh, it, it's, you can't live like that. I mean, you know, and, and it's not just me who's, who's that way. I mean, I, I look at the people who live in Ukraine right now, live in Kiev. Um, every night they get bombed. And how do you live with that? You can just get used to it. People sleep through the bombings now in Ukraine just because you have to. How can you live your life over a long period of time with that type of thing hanging over your head? And so, and I, and I would also say, I mean, there's a lot of people that, that are absolutely desperately afraid of Putin. And then uh, if, you, if you feel that fear, then, then you um, censor yourself. You then react to that. And so you can't, I, I, at least in my case, I can't live in fear because if I did, then I would stop doing what I'm doing. And I, and I owe it to Sergei. And, I, um, and he, he was in a much more precarious position um, than I could ever be in. He was in their custody. 
he stood up to them, and it's my duty to him um, to continue to stand up to, him, to them. You've had more reason, certainly, than anyone I know and anyone I'm aware of uh, to think about Vladimir Putin and what drives him, uh, both as a target yourself and as a human rights campaigner. So what's your answer to that in a very general way? What drives Vladimir Putin? Well, this is the thing that's most interesting, um, which is my view, and I, and I think I know better than almost anybody what drives him. And you have all sorts of people in Washington and the White House and the State Department. They're political scientists. Um, what drives Putin is money. He likes to steal money. Every, no, there's not a person in Russia that goes into public service to do anything other than steal money. That's why you go into government, from the lowest level traffic cop to the president of Russia. And so in order to understand Vladimir Putin, you have to be a criminologist, not a Kremlinologist. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, it, it's, for, for, for most of his, his presidency, it was about maximizing profit. And then he got to this place recently in the last two years where he realized that he stole too much money. So I estimate, and you can read about this in my book, my second book, that in the 22 years, this is 22 years before the war started, when Putin first came to power, um, Putin and about 1,000 people around him had stolen a trillion dollars from the Russian state. This is money that should have been spent on health care and schools and public services, was spent on um, yachts and villas, and private planes, and Swiss bank accounts. And it was all pretty exciting for these guys to like, you know, keep on piling it in. But after a while, the, the, what it does is it creates a totally combustible situation, whereas you know, everybody, you, know, you just can't do this forever in a country where you have so many people that aren't getting the money. And the analogy that I use is like, it's like just spreading gasoline on the floor. And um, all it takes is just like a one match and the whole thing combusts. And Putin understands very clearly that if he's not in power, he's dead. And so it started out as a profit maximizing exercise and then it's now morphed into a survival exercise. So how do you survive if you've stolen too much money and you're worried about people turning on you, getting angry with you. Well, you find somebody else for them to get angry with, a foreign country. And he started a war so that he could deflect the anger of the Russian people away from him towards the Ukrainians. That's the reason why this war is happening. It's not for any other reason. And um, it's not because of NATO enlargement. It's not because he has some grand vision of a, of a, of a Russian empire. It's because he's a little man, short little man, who's stolen too much money and is terrified of dying, and he's ready to do anything to stay alive. And, and that's, that's an understanding that, that I have, and, and Alexei Navalny would tell you the same thing, and Gary Kasparov would tell you the same thing. It's not an understanding that they have at the National Security Council. Um, it's not an understanding they have in the State Department. They think that he's like them. You know, we're statesmen, he's a statesman, we just need to discuss statehood and negotiate and so on, have, have diplomacy. That's not how it works with these types of people. It's like a mafia guy. Ukraine, if money drives Putin, what about nationalism? I mean, I've, I, I, even, I saw him at a rally in a city east of Moscow, a couple hundred miles east of Moscow once, and he said to people, we were a superpower again once, and we will be a superpower again. You don't think that dreams of empire have something to do with Ukraine? He thinks to himself, this used to be ours, it'll be ours again. Absolutely not. I think that he said all those things for sure. <clears throat> he writes them down, and he has a guy <clears throat> who sits and tells him the stuff to say. He's scripted. That's what you say. I mean, the Russian people feel that way, for sure. That's how you get the Russian, you, you can't say, I, I want to be the richest guy in the world. I'm going to take all of your money and I want you to support me. You've got to give them something to, to like grab onto. Um, and, and, and the proof of, of what I'm saying is very simple. If, if, you care, if, if, he was, if he cared about the nation of Russia, if he was a, a real patriot, if he cared about the national interests of the Russian people, he wouldn't have stolen or allowed to have stolen all the money of the Russian people and hollowed out every institution in the Russian state. Everything is hollowed out. There's nothing there. You get 10 miles out of Moscow, the roads stop. 
everything is hollowed out. You, you, you die 20 years younger in Russia as a male than you do in the West because they don't have health care. That is not the act of a person who cares about his empire. You may not be, uh, I guess, professionally qualified, but clinically, having studied the man so closely, uh, you are qualified to answer the question. Do you think he's a sociopath? No. no. I, I think he's a psychopath. Um. He, he is the kind of person who, if, if a child was being tortured in front of him, his heart wouldn't beat any faster. He has truly no empathy whatsoever. Ukraine is being tortured in front of him. He has, and, and, and his own people, 240,000 young men, he has sent them into battle to die. That is almost 20 times the number of people who died in the 10-year Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. He doesn't care. His heart does not start beating faster. He does not lose a wink of sleep at night. All he cares about is his own survival um, and perhaps some people very close to him, and that's it. And, and there's, it's, it's the definition of, of a psychopath. So for all the speculation, particularly since the rebellion, what is it, three or four weeks ago now, the short-lived rebellion against him, uh, you don't buy the idea that he might be overthrown, that the people closest to him might uh, usurp his power? Oh, no, I definitely buy that idea. You so, do? So I think that, that this, the events of the last three weeks have been the single most damning thing that could have ever happened to him in the, all the time that I've seen him in power. So remember that this is a guy who has stayed in power for 23 years. How has he stayed in power for so long? Um, as a dictator, he's created the image that if you challenge him, terrible things are gonna happen to you. You're gonna die, you're gonna go to jail, you're gonna be pushed into exile. That's his, that's the message to the Russian people. Everybody respected that message, nobody challenged him. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this guy, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Not out of nowhere, I mean, he came out of somewhere. Um, but this guy, Yevgeny Prigozhin, emerges. And, he, and, and, and the way I describe this conflict that arose, it's kind of like office politics. He was, Yevgeny Prigozhin was the only, everyone else in Russia, all these officials, we're just stealing money. All the generals, all the, the defense minister, the, the, um, the, the, the head of the army, they're all just stealing money and just terrible at their job. And, that's, and by the way, they, they, the Russian defense budget was 70 billion, 60 billion of that was stolen. They all have these amazing villas and yachts and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and they couldn't do their job properly. And then this, this, guy, this one guy comes along, Yevgeny Prigozhin. He starts out as a hot dog vendor in, in a flea market. He was a a convict, gets out of jail, hot dog vendor, catering, starts catering for the Kremlin, then starts catering for the defense ministry. He, he's, a, he's a real entrepreneur and, and does stuff. He, makes money, he steals money and stuff, but he does stuff. And um, Putin got him involved in, in, he set up this thing called the um, uh, St. Petersburg Troll Factory. This is a, a, a real thing. They call it the Internet Research Agency. And he was the one doing all this interference. He was the one that the 12 guys that were indicted by Robert Mueller at the beginning of my story, they were for Prigozhin. He's just like a, a true entrepreneur. He's like the Elon Musk of evil in Russia. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he just like performs. You know, Elon Musk did PayPal and, and, and all this stuff. This guy's doing the same thing. He was doing <laughs> catering and then internet trolling. And then he starts doing mercenary stuff. And he's really good in Africa. And, and he's got a whole bunch of mercenary operations in Africa. The entire Russian foreign policy is based on his mercenary operations in Africa. And then the war starts, and Putin's guys, the, the defense minister and all these people, were failing miserably, unbelievably, because they were so bad at their job because all they cared about was stealing money. They weren't actually, do, and all the people below them were stealing money. It was just one big money-stealing operation. And, and, they, did, and they were fl flailing and failing in the war. And so this guy steps in and he goes around all the prisons in Russia and says, I, I want all of your meanest, murdering, rapist, assault, I want all of them. And he says, I, all of you guys come work for me in this war. If you survive, you get pardoned. And he builds up this team of the most brutal, horrible people you could ever imagine. Um, and, he, and, and so you have this situation where you have these really, these. It's, it reminds me of, of like when I worked in an investment bank, you have this like, 
big producer who's like bringing in like 80% of all the money for the investment bank, young, young person. And then these old managing directors that aren't doing anything, but just like, you know, sitting there. And then the producer says, I want, you know, I, I want these guys fired. This is, this is what he said to, the, to, to Putin. I want them fired. And Putin said, uh, uh, no. And, um, and, then, and then these guys, these old managing directors that weren't producing, they then tried to kill him, literally tried to kill him. They tried bombing where he was and they didn't succeed. And so he, he gets angry and he takes all of his mercenaries and turns around from Ukraine and goes towards Rostov, where, in the main military base where they're all sitting and takes over the military. And it turns out that nobody is, is, is um, stopping them. There, there, there wasn't a single shot fired. There was like people taking pictures and selfies and putting <coughs> flowers and giving them candies. <laughs> and it turns out that, that like the whole system is just one big Potemkin village. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a fraud, it's a, it's a facade. They, they get to, uh, to, uh, to Rostov, nobody stops them. And so then, then they, they go to Voronezh, which is the next town. Nobody's stopping them. People are cheering them. Um, and and uh, Lipetsk, and they're, they're on their way to Moscow. And at this point, the guys, the, the FSB, the KGB guys who work for Putin, who had spent like 99% of their time doing extortion rackets, like f finally figured out where, where, where Prigozhin's um, wife and daughter live and they like go and grab them as hostages. And then I think that they, they convince Prigozhin that, that some of the people who were on his side in Moscow were on his side and, and he stops. But it didn't start out, Prigozhin wasn't intending to overthrow Putin. It just was one of these office, it was like office politics that just went, mm. went crazy. And, and um, but, but it's, it's and, and the most interesting thing about this is, and, and if anyone remembered in Turkey, there was a, um, a, an attempted coup of Erdogan, the, uh, their, their bad president. And, and Erdogan went and arrested like 50,000 people, like every, every judge, every professor, every doctor, every person who he thought was even mildly not on his side is in jail. And what we expected the same thing for Putin to do. And, and, and particularly with Prigozhin, they, they should have taken him, if a good dictator would take him to Red Square and put his head in the guillotine and chop it off on national television. But they didn't do that. Um, instead, on, on the day that Prigozhin was, was, was on his way to Moscow, the FSB raided his office. They found a bunch of fake passports and wigs and all sorts of other strange things and $111 million of cash. They took the cash which they, which they often do when they do these raids. And then a week later, they returned him the money. And, then they, and Putin then had a meeting with him in the Kremlin, and him and his 25 guys. That's not the actions of a strong man. Putin is, is, is mortally wounded by this whole thing, because if you're the dictator now, everyone thinks, you know what? Maybe I've got a shot. And by the way, all these people want to have the same job because it's, there's a trillion dollars of money to steal the next round. And so it's a pretty attractive gig to be president. I, I read uh, the description of that whole series of events by one of the Kremlin spokespeople as an exhibit of transparency. <laughs> it's more the other way around. Isn't it? Well, I mean, it's, it's an exhibit of, of total frailty of, of Putin. And, and um, I think that this is the most interesting moment ever in terms of uh, a change of, a possible change of power. And I should point out that we only know 5% of what's happened. 95%, we don't know what's going on. Um, but what we do know is going on is that the image of Putin being this beloved strong man has been permanently popped. And, and by the way, Prigozhin, one of, his, one of the things he did to really in, in, you know, infuse his, his brutality on the um, psyche of the Russian people is that there, there was a soldier in his Wagner battalion who had surrendered to the Ukrainians and in some prisoner swap he was returned. And, and Prigozhin was so angry that he had surrendered that he... he um, uh, he made a video, was like, this was like an Al-Qaeda, I mean, an ISIS video, where he put the guy's head against a cinder block and then took a sledgehammer and just bashed his brains in and, and sent it out. And, and I'll tell you something interesting, is that now all over Russia, they have Wagner sledgehammers as, as like, uh, 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 and people are buying them. This guy's a folk hero in Russia because they, they, the Russians mostly respect, you know, raw, Power. And it's not like they, they love, or love Putin versus him. They, they just want to go know who, who's the powerful guy that they need to be reporting to. How loved or unloved is Putin? I once had the head of Levada. You might know what that is. It's a Russian, fairly reliable Russian polling agency, tell me that, and this was probably a dozen years ago, that roughly 40% of people polled said it wouldn't be so bad to have Stalin back. 
So that said, do you have any idea from your own sources and contacts in Russia, in Moscow, how popular he is or isn't? Well, so here, here's the interesting thing about, so according to Levada, he has an 80% approval rating. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but just imagine this, this is a country where if you hold up an empty sign, it doesn't say anything on it, just like you say, I'm protesting, they'll arrest you and sentence you to eight years in prison. So some random person comes to you that you don't know and says, do you support the president? Um, what are you going to say? <laughs> but, 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 and on top of that, what, what, what's most interesting, I just learned about this recently, is what is the response rate when Levada goes out and polls? 95% of the people don't respond. And so only 5% of the people are responding, 80% of them say they support the president, and so the other 2% are going to jail. I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, it's... It's, it's, um, so I don't think he's that popular. I, don't, I think it's all a big, the whole thing is a big myth. And the myth that, that was shattered when, when some other guy comes and tries to take over the country and, and everyone is just cheering and putting flowers on the tanks. It, it, that, that tells you everything. Okay, I have one more question, and it's a big question to be answered in a brief time, please, because then it's time for the audience questions. Uh, I saw in an interview that you believe, don't, I, I hope I don't mischaracterize what you said, that while we're in some ways hurting Russia, we aren't hurting them nearly enough. What should we be doing from your point of view? Well, um, so, so basically, so the, the other huge Washington, Brussels, uh, London misconception is that there's some possibility that there's a negotiated outcome to this conflict. Um, Putin has never negotiated anything in his life. He's never compromised because to compromise is a, is a sign of weakness and any, any, any display of weakness, he'll, he'll permanently be destroyed. Putin doesn't negotiate and will not negotiate and cannot negotiate without losing his job and losing his life. The Ukrainians, in the first three weeks of the war, Zelensky was desperate to negotiate. But he's not desperate anymore for one simple reason, because they've seen what happened in, in Bucha and Irpin and all these other places where the, Russian, the, the women were all raped and then killed and put in shallow graves and the men were castrated and the kids were taken to, all the kids were taken away and sent to the far east of Russia. And so the Ukrainians can't forgive that anymore. And nor can they forgive the idea that if they were to give away any territory, everybody in that territory would have the same fate happen to them. And so there's not, a, there's not an ounce of support for any type of negotiation for the Ukrainians. And so how does this thing play itself out? There's only one way. Well, two ways. Either Russia wins or Ukraine wins. And, and if for some reason Russia were to win, I mean, they're, they're not, they're not going to stop at Ukraine because remember, Putin's at this war because he needs to be at war. He'll then go to Poland or, or Estonia, and then we have a much worse situation on our hands. Then we have to decide, are we going to go to war with Russia to defend a NATO ally, or are we going to abandon our NATO ally and let everyone, every man for himself in Europe? Or the other alternative is that the Ukrainians win. Um, last summer, I was at the Aspen Security Forum, and Jake Sullivan was there. And Jake Sullivan, who is the president's national security advisor, said it. He, he, it was no secret. He said, we want to give them enough uh, equipment so the Russians don't win, but we don't want to give them so much that it provokes or um, escalates the Russians. And so to answer the question, the only way that this thing can end in, in a satisfactory way from our perspective is if we give them enough weapons to win, which they could win. But we haven't. We've always, it's always been a, it's incremental and incremental and incremental and not a little too little but too late. And it seems, you know, very sort of narrow, self-interestedly, from our perspective, for America, um, absolutely the right thing to do to give them whatever they want. At the moment, we're, we're spending 5% of our military budget with no loss of American lives to totally degrade our second most awful adversary. It just seems like a no-brainer. But there's such cautiousness, such, such um, restraint in Washington that we're not doing nearly enough. And as a result, this thing may carry on and carry on. And had we done a lot more before, the Russians wouldn't have been able to dig in where they've dug in so far. They've dug in really deeply. They've got all trenches and mines and all this kind of stuff out there. And it's very hard for the Ukrainians to penetrate that right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got James Kenley with a microphone and I think Chris Sable on this side. 
Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. If they give you the microphone, please stand. Please just ask a short question. Don't make a long statement. The one other thing I'll add is please speak into the microphone, not near the microphone, but right into it. Yes. And we're going to start with Chris on that side, and I'll be here looking for our next one. Check one, two. Uh, good evening. My name's Kevin Tice. I live here in Vail. Um, I started at Solomon Brothers in 1989 Investment Banking. Yay. Um, so we overlapped, although I was in New York the whole time. Uh, a great firm, by the way. Um, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the, the first question is, what's the chance, given how you've described Putin, that the nuclear option, which we hear is bandied about and is frightening, obviously, um, what's the likelihood that it comes down to something like that? And how do we know, it seems to me that the Washington, Washington's goal, notwithstanding your comments from Jake Sullivan, but Washington's goal is regime change in Russia. How do we know that if we are successful at that, either with Ukraine or another way, that we are not unleashing other forces that, that may not be good for all of us. And it's not like Ukraine is the, you know, golden child of democracy and, and sunshine, as we all know. Thank you. So, so the, the, um, the, uh, the sort of the trillion dollar question, the nuclear risk, um, Putin could do anything, okay? He, he has the capacity to do anything. I never thought he would invade Ukraine in the first place. It seems so foolhardy in advance. People ask me, would he invade in the weeks leading up to it? I said, no, it's insane. He wouldn't do it. It doesn't make any sense. And he did it. So um, Putin does things that don't seem to make sense. It certainly doesn't make sense for him to use any nuclear weapons for a lot of reasons. First of all, it doesn't win the war. All it does is it, it kills however many people it kills. The Ukrainians are not going to then surrender because he uses nuclear weapons. Now, the Ukrainians understand that, that if, if they come under Russian control, they die one way or another, and so they're not going to surrender. The second thing is that, you know, we have all pr a pretty consistent view of Russia, which is we don't like Putin, we don't like Russia, and that's our view here in the United States, it's the view of the people in the UK, the people of Europe. But about half the world doesn't have that view. China, India, Indonesia, all these other people are sort of supporting, either supporting or staying on the sidelines or whatever. All those guys would immediately defect and become anti-Russia as well. They wouldn't be able to tolerate the use of a nuclear weapon. And Russia would be more isolated than North Korea after that, which I don't think Putin wants to have happen. The third thing is that um, we in the United States and our allies in NATO, um, we can't really allow any country to use a nuclear weapon without consequences. We don't necessarily have to respond to a nuclear attack on Ukraine by, by uh, uh, another nuclear attack on Russia. That's not going to happen. But we, can't, we can also not do nothing. If we do nothing, then Pakistan or it's, I mean, all these countries that have nuclear weapons, could, we're, we're in an age of total danger. And so I can imagine that there's a whole array of options that we could use that NATO could use. We could sink the Black Sea Fleet in one afternoon. Um, we could cyber attack uh, uh, the electricity grid in Russia so they no longer have electricity. We could do all sorts of things, um, which we probably told them we would do if they, if they use nuclear weapons. Um, and, then, and then there's the final thing, which is that the, the wind blows east. And, um, and so, uh, does it, is it, so does that mean he's not going to? No. But I, th but I think that, that you know, he's a, he's a little man interested in his own survival, and I think that this leads to his demise almost immediately. On, on the second question about um, uh, regime change, there's a lot of people in Washington that were re really happy that Prigozhin failed a few weeks ago. They were saying, God, look, at he's such a mass monster because of the you know, videos. Um, but Prigozhin has said very explicitly that he'd end the war in Ukraine if, if, uh, if, it was, if he had anything to do with it. He's also a guy who hasn't made his money yet. And so may maybe, he, maybe if he became president, um, he would be focusing internally on shaking down all the oligarchs and making the money for a while instead of all, all this other stuff. I'm not saying that he's a good guy, he's a monster, but I'm just saying that we shouldn't be so, it, it's not our job to, to, to have regime change or not have regime change. It's our job to contain Russia in the most uh, robust way possible. 
Um, and it's our job to help Ukraine um, expel them. And, and I think that we should just be focusing on the tasks at hand and let the chips fall where they may, as opposed to trying to keep Putin in power or give him an off-ramp or, or any of that kind of stuff, which is what some of these people say. Bill, I'd like to add one more element to the question, to the trillion dollar nuclear question. Uh, during the arms talks between the United States and the Soviet Union, which went on for many years, Putin already was an upward comer, and he understands the foundation of the treaties, which was mutual assured destruction, known as MAD. And he's not, my guess, fortunately I'm not in charge of American policy, but my guess is he's not a suicide bomber with a, his nation strapped to his chest. He understands that if he uses nuclear weapons, in all likelihood they're going to be used against him. Yeah. Who's next? Thank you. And thank, you for this your, way. thank you for your fascinating presentation. Uh, easy question. Can you provide any details about the relationship between Putin and Mr. Trump? Thank you. <laughs> Good luck. Well, I, I have a pretty clear view on this thing. So, um, uh, first of all, you know, the PP tape, you know, compromise. I don't think, uh, I, I mean, there may be lots of tapes. Um, but as we've seen, um, Trump is pretty much unblackmailable. I mean, um, he, he can do anything, and, and he can organize an insurrection on January 6th, and somehow that's okay. Um, so I don't think there's any blackmail involved. The other thing I would say is that Trump has proved himself to be a guy who defaults on everybody. So there, there's this argument that, that the Russians have money with him, and, um, and therefore he feels like he owes them something. Um, He's defaulted on every single person who's ever lent him money in every single situation in the entire history. <laughs> so I, I don't think that, 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 that that's what's going on. He just strikes me as being sort of a sleazy New York real estate guy. Um, <laughs> and he, he's just looking for the guys with the dough. You know, who's got the dough? Um, and, and um, uh, you know, Putin's got the dough. Mohammed bin Salman's got the dough. The Chinese guy's got the dough. Um, and, and um, you know, maybe some money will come his way if he treats them nice. Um, and, and, and that's as simple as it is. And money does come his way. Look at these, uh, his son-in-law uh, son got $2 billion from the Saudis um, for his investment fund. And I can tell you, I met the guy. He's not a private equity guy who deserves to get any money from anybody. <laughs> Um, so, so I, I think it's just that, and, and um, uh, I don't think there's anything more sinister than just a, just a sleazy dude, you know, wanting to get money. <laughs> Who's next? Over here. Hi. Thank you for your um, scenario about your second book and how the Wi-Fi was off, and so I wanted to know if you were coming out with a third book. <laughs> and, um, but my question also is about the Magnitsky Act, and I wanted to know, I was wondering if you could sort of expand a little bit about how that's been used in the war that we're seeing in Ukraine, how we could use it better, and if, as advocates uh, with our electeds, we could have conversations about it to maybe use more targeted sanctions or whatever you recommend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, well, the as far as the third book is concerned, the story's not over. It carries on. Um, I, I hope that, that I don't have the crazy, dangerous life that I've had for the last 15 years to justify a book about me. Maybe it'll be a book about some one of my friends or some part of the story. Um, but the story is definitely not over, so um, I would, I, I mean, it, for me, writing a book is really a painful exercise. It, uh, I'm not a natural writer. It, 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 it reads easily because I spend three years on each book, um, and, and I really have to put a lot of time and effort into it. Um, on the Magnitsky Act, it's, so the Magnitsky Act is the template which is now, which is now being used in the war in Ukraine. It's also the, the, the Magnitsky Act is also being used all over the world. Um, uh, there's, there are, the Chinese government has set up concentration camps for, for the Uyghur minority and in, in Muslim minority in, in Xinjiang, and four of the Chinese generals are on the Magnitsky list. Um, Nineteen Saudis were involved in the grisly murder of Mohammed bin, of, of um, uh, Jamal Khashoggi um, are on the list and many other places. And so the Magnitsky Act is being used widely and it's used, being used deeply um, as far as Russia. And I wouldn't say the Magnitsky Act per se, it's, it's an offshoot of the Magnitsky Act. The Magnitsky Act was a template and they now use it in other ways. 
I would say as far as Russia is concerned, we're now really kind of getting them good. I mean, um, just today, uh, the former finance minister of Russia, his name is Alexei Kudrin, was, was sanctioned. He was considered to be, it was really interesting because a lot of people who lived in Moscow, he spoke English and he was considered to be an economic reformer and so they thought he was one of the good guys. And, and the, one of the FT correspondent um, from Moscow, the former FT correspondent said, it's really strange that this guy was sanctioned. And, and I was saying, you know, this was the guy in charge of, um, of the tax ministry when, when they did the $230 million tax refund that Sergei Magnitsky was killed over. I'm glad he was sanctioned. And so, so we're, we're, I mean, the, the, the sanctions are being rolled out probably more aggressively than I could have ever imagined. Um, we've sanctioned about half of the oligarchs so far. There's another half to go. They should be sanctioned. Um, and what happens is every time there's an atrocity or something more awful, we look for what we can do and sanctioning seems to be the thing we can do. And so it's good, we're, we're sanctioning them. Ultimately, the one thing that we should be doing, which we're not doing, is um, we need to, to cut off Russia's export of oil completely and 100%. <clears throat> If we did that, they wouldn't have any money left. And if they don't have any money left, they can't pay for this war. And, um, and we don't seem to have the guts to do that. And, for, and for, for kind of good reason, because we don't want the oil price to go up. But so here we're stuck in this place where Russia sells their oil, gets money. We don't want to really stop them from selling their oil. And then we've got to give money to the Ukrainians to fight them using the money that they're getting from the oil to fight the Ukrainians. And so we could just, if we just stop them from getting the money for the oil, and there's ways of doing that, um, then we wouldn't have to pay all this money to st have them, uh, have the Ukrainians fight back because the war would be over. But uh, we haven't been able to bite the bullet and do that. Bill, circling back to the book, 30 seconds. It would see, you tell a story. Each book, you just tell a story. What happened from A to Z. Didn't you just sit down and say, here's how I tell the story? Why was it so painful? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you why it's so painful, because I wrote it for the reader instead of for the writer. So um, it's really easy to write down anything. You can write anything on a piece of yeah. paper. But, um, uh, and, and I should point out that I'm a terrible reader. I, I have really the l lowest threshold for boredom of almost anybody. And so if I get a book, so many books, I get 30 pages in, and I, I just like, don't care what's going to happen next. And, and, I, and I just put them down. And I just so, so didn't want that to happen with any of my books. And so every sentence I wrote, I, was, I, I then read it and said, would anyone else want to read this sentence? Would anyone want to then yeah. read the next sentence and the next sentence and the next sentence? Good answer. And, and back and forth and back and forth. And, and then I gave them to my 16-year-old son. And if he could read it um, and be interested, <laughs> then, then, then I knew that I was in, in, in good shape. Okay. Next question over here. My name is Gary Barant, and Bill, you and I were in Moscow at the same time. In 1988, I went there to start the first advertising agency for Jung and Rubicam. Mm -hmm. Those were heady days. That was glasnost, perestroika, and there was a spirit of openness and energy. We hired seven young people, and they all came early to work to learn how to do marketing. My question is, do you think if we had treated the Soviet Union after the Cold War the same way we treated Germany and Japan after World War II, we would not have Putin today? Hmm. Um, no. I, I, I think that, that this is not our fault. Um, this is not our fault. They have, they have Russia is a very rich country. They have a huge amount of natural resources that generates a huge amount of money. The, the, the entire blame for this thing um, comes down to the way in which the Yeltsin uh, allowed the oligarchs to take over the country. And what caused all this trouble was that tw at the time, 22 oligarchs stole 40% of the country from the people of Russia. And the average Russian then lived in destitute poverty. The, I think life expect, the male life expectancy at that, at that moment in time was like 58 years. You'd die if you were, I'd be dead if I was Russian already. Um, and nurses had to become prostitutes and professor, uh, professors, taxi drivers and art museums were selling the art off the wall. And that created uh, humiliation 
it wasn't us, it wasn't our problem that they, that they allowed like a small number of people to steal all the money, it was their problem. And that, allowed, that created humiliation and Putin responded to that humiliation by coming in and saying, I'm gonna correct it. But instead of correcting it, he just made it even more horrible. And so this wasn't our fault. This was the fault of having a totally corrupt country, no rule of law, no institutions. And we, we can't make them have institutions. That, that's, that was their job to do that, and they didn't. And, uh, and so we can take the, I'll tell you where we can take the blame, is Putin is 95% responsible. I think we're 5% responsible because when he was doing bad stuff, we looked the other way. When he invaded Georgia, we looked the other way. When he took Crimea, we looked the other way. When he carpet bombed Syria, we looked the other way. When he cheated the Olympics, we looked the other way. When he, when he poisoned people all over the world, we looked the other way. And so he was of the, of the assumption that we're always gonna look the other way. And that we're responsible for. And, and if he had known the consequences would be so devastating, that we had the capacity to be so devastating, he might not have done this Ukrainian thing, but he, he didn't know that because we gave him every reason not to think that. Uh, Bill, my name is Mark Goldstein. I'm from Washington, D.C. I've read both of your books. As a lawyer, I found the legal side of your books to be extremely fascinating. In Washington, we haven't seen too much about all of this, uh, except, you know, Zelensky appears here and there, and we're supporting Ukraine. My thinking is, what if we cut a deal, an economic deal with China? If China could somehow be persuaded to turn against Putin, and I don't know what we would need to do to grease those skids, but they have economic issues, and I think there's a lot of things we can do to help that country in exchange for an anti-Putin or at least some persuasion that he turned back the clock. Well, I, I, um, I don't think that China is actually doing that much for Putin. So China is, is sort of um, helping them out at the UN a little bit, you know, uh, vetoing things at the, um, <clears throat> at the UN Security Council. China is providing a, a bit of money for their oil. But China's not arming Russia. They're not financing Russia. Um, thankful, thank God they're not, because if China was, then, then um, the war would be in a lot different place. If Russia had Chinese weapons, um, Ukraine would be in a real mess. I, I don't think that China, I, I, I don't think China is the um, linchpin to this whole thing. I think the linchpin is, is um, the Ukrainians and, and, and military equipment. If we provided the Ukrainians with enough equipment, they could win this war. Um, it's as simple as that. And we're, we are still hesitating, holding back. And, um, and, and, you, and, and, and there's no mystery about that. You can hear them screaming bloody murder, saying, why don't you just give us more, give us more. Um, the British defense uh, minister um, was criticizing Zelensky, saying he's ungrateful. Well, well you know, I mean, they're the ones dying for us because we would be dying if, they, if the Ukrainians weren't dying in our place. And so we, we should be giving them everything. And I don't, think, I don't think it's all that complicated. I think it's just give them the weapons and let them, give them what they ask for and give them as much as they ask for and let them fight it out. And one rationale for that is if Ukraine loses, the West loses. Indeed. One more question over here. Greg, you've got our last question, sir. Well, I'm not gonna ask a question because you've answered almost everything. <laughs> I will just say that I'm grateful to you. Because, I mean, the world is no better off right now than it was an hour and a half ago when we started. But thanks to you, we understand a little better why that is and also a little bit about what might be done about it. Bill Browder, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.